السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نستعينه ونستغفره ونستهليه ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يظهره فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد قال المصنف الإمام البخاري رحمه الله تعالى ورضي عنه ونفعنا بعلومه وعلوم مشائخنا وعلوم سائر الصالحين في الدارين آمين باب هل يقول المولى إني من فلان In the previous chapters we learned about the importance of Silat rahim that we must have good ties, uh, good relationships with our biological relatives. So over here Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi shows that the Silat rahim and the importance of good relations is not necessarily restricted to biological relations. In fact, the scope of kinship is on a much wider scale than we tend to think, as Sheikh Adil Salahi says in his English commentary. That in this hadith, there is mention of a different type of relationship, which we don't have in this day and age which is known as Mawlal Ataqa. That if a man or a woman frees a slave, then that slave is associated with the tribe of that person. Okay. Now, before I move forward, I think it would be appropriate to just touch very slightly and the topic of slavery in Islam, because this is something that is often raised as an objection, that if Allah Ta'ala has created all humans as equal, then why is there a concept of slavery? So the first thing we must remember is that Islam did not invent or initiate uh, and introduce slavery to the world is something that had been going on for many generations before Rasulullah was sent and it was common around the whole world at the time or most of the world what Islam now what Islam did do is it limited number one how it limited how a person can become a slave Somebody could say, why didn't Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam abolish slavery altogether? Possibly because their society was so dependent upon it that you know, it would have been extremely difficult and their whole society would collapse if he had all of a sudden um, abolished it. Also, there were so many slaves within Arabia and these slaves depended on their masters. They had never been taught, never been shown how to live independently. They didn't have tribes, clans, um, and the support systems that were needed at the time. So if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had abolished slavery, Allahu alam, uh, we could say that it, it wasn't practical, it wasn't possible at that time. But what Rasulullah Sallallahu did do is you could say he, he started, he led the Ummah on the path to the abolishment of slavery in a way that nobody before him or after him has done. Number one, Islam limited how a person could become a slave. In Jahiliyyah, what would happen? You know, somebody could be traveling alone. Okay, and somebody could just kidnap him and say, you're my slave, and that person is a slave. Zayd bin Haritha, the adopted son, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was born a free child 
But as a young child, he was kidnapped and he was made into a slave. And somehow he came into the ownership of Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and she gifted him to Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, freed him and adopted him as a child instead. So there's many examples like this. People like Bilal and others, radiallahu anhum, they were from Africa, they were just bought as slaves. So anybody could make anyone into a slave, but Islam limited it. That the only way you can make a free person into a slave in Islam would be if they are brought as prisoners of war. Now, the prisoners of war uh, was and even now is a huge problem in the world that if there is a war between two nations, two groups, and some prisoners and soldiers are captured, what do we do? Okay? There used to be a few choices. One would be that they would just kill all those soldiers. Right? That was a practice that would happen. However, by doing that, so many humans are you know, killed and destroyed. So that's not the ideal solution. Another solution is, okay, let them go free, let them go back. But if you let them go back, the chances are they'll just train better, train harder, re, you know, equip themselves better and come back to fight you. So that is not a sensible solution. Another solution is imprison them, which is what happens nowadays in the modern world. You put them in prison. But then the state has to bear the burden of you know, feeding them, looking after them, and they're stuck between four walls for the rest of their life or most of their remaining life. That's not ideal either. So Islam said that they can live in our communities and we will give them half the rights of our people. Rasulullah taught how to look after your slaves. That feed them from what you eat, clothe them from what you wear. And there are so many ahadith um, in relation to how one should treat the slaves and how well one should treat them. And then further to that, Islam opened the doors of freeing slaves in a way that was never never happened before. That there's so much ajar and thawab for freeing slaves that Sahaba would purposely go out buy slaves with the intention of freeing them. Okay, you know, if you make a mistake, you accidentally kill someone, or you take an oath, and you're not able to fulfill it, or you're fasting in Ramadan, and you deliberately uh, broke the fast, or you did zihar with your wife, it was all different, different issues in fiqh, then the penalty is you free a slave if you have one. So, Islam encourages freeing of slaves. There's a famous incident of Ghazwatu Banil Mustalik, where a huge tribe um, was brought, uh, captured and many of them were turning to slaves. Juwaliya came into the ownership of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, you know, freed her and married her. So when the Sahaba learned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has married Juwaliya, then they all said, well, this is the, these are the in-laws of Rasulullah. This tribe are the in-laws of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we don't want to own their slaves. And the Sahaba freed those all the slaves of that tribe. So Aisha radiallahu anha says that I've never seen a lady as blessed as Juwaliya that so many slaves were freed just because of her. This is one of the wisdoms of Rasulullah sallallahu marrying Juwaliya that you know, the Sahaba, out of respect for her tribe, freed all those slaves. So Islam encourages freeing of slaves. First of all, Islam limited how a slave could become a slave. Secondly, Islam teaches to treat slaves uh, in a way that no other civilization has ever done um, and given them rights more than anybody else ever did in the past. And thirdly, it encourages the freeing of slaves. Now, we don't have the concept of slavery in the world and ulama have said that this is not a bad thing, it's a good thing, so we don't need to try and reinstate this concept now. So, in this hadith, there is mention of uh, connection with slaves. Now think, if you go back to the 
you know, the era of the uh, Rasulullah, the Sahaba, um, if a slave maybe might be from Africa, might be from Iran, like Salman Farsi was, might be from the somewhere in the Roman Empire, and they've been brought to Arabia and they've been made a slave. And then for years they've lived with this family as the slave. They don't know anybody else. Suddenly you free them and you say, you know, you go out in the world and fend for yourself. Then they ha- they'll have no support. So the hadith says that even that slave who you free, you still have a connection. If that person is in need, you must support them, look after them. And there are some uh, even masail of inheritance that if if, a, if that person dies and there's nobody else to inherit them, no blood relations, the master will be the one to inherit them. And if any penalty, any um, there's certain punishments like diyat comes upon that person, then the the master who freed him should support him, even though there's no ownership anymore. But that link stays for the rest of their life. So this is referred to here. The word Mawla in the Arabic language has so many meanings. The most famous one is God, Allahu Mawlana. Also Sayyid, Master is called Mawla. Friend is also called Mawla. A slave or freed slave is also called Mawla. So there's a few types of Mawalat, these relations that can be, these bonds that can be created between people. One is Mawla al-Ataqa, the bond between uh, a man uh, or, a, or, a, or a person who freed a slave. That, that bond is called Mawla al-Ataqa, between the freed slave and the master. One is the bond of Hilf and Munasara. Sometimes a person would just come from you know, another area, from out of Arabia, He's come and settled in these lands and he has nobody, no family or no support. So he would just make an agreement with someone. For example, he came to Makkah to live. So he'd choose a family in Makkah and say, can I have an agreement with you? That I will help you. If you need, you will help me if I need. So this is also a type of mu'alad and, you know, uh, which was popular at that time. And a third one is the wala'ul islam. That if a person accepted Islam at the hands of of a person of a certain tribe, then he would be aligned with and connected to that tribe. For example, Imam Bukhari, we may have learned, we may have discussed in the uh, earlier lessons that he's known as Al Bukhari Al Ju'fi. So Ju'fa is an Arab tribe, and Imam Bukhari is not of Arab origin. So the Muhaddithin say that the likelihood is that the uh, Great grandfather, okay, or one of the the grandfather or great grandfather Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, um, would have accepted Islam at the hands of somebody from that tribe. So he's known as Ju'fi. Okay. So the heading of the chapter is Babun Hal Yaqulul Mawla Inni Min Bani Fulan. That if there is a freed slave, is it okay for him to say that I am from this tribe? So we read the Athar first. Uh, حدثنا عبد الرحمن بن حبيب قال قال لي عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله تعالى عنهما ممن أنت قلت من بني تميم قال من أنفسهم أو من مواليهم قلت من مواليهم قال فهلا قلت من مواليهم إذن عبد الرحمن بن حبيب said that Abdullah ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما asked me to whom do you belong which tribe are you from I said to Tim of Tamim he said, are you one of themselves or one of their mawlas? I said, I am one of their mawlas. He said, should you have not then said that you are one of their mawlas? So this Athar seem, uh, of Ibn Umar anha, seems to uh, indicate that it's not permissible for the freed slave to attribute himself to the tribe of the ones who freed him because you know what objected that you should have clarified that you are from the maulas however the answer we can give to this is that this is only because ibn umar wanted to you know get to know him and get to know his full background he said when you introduce someone don't make it sound like you are actually from them when you're not so his purpose was to know who he is, where he's from, what his background is, to get to know him personally. Otherwise, in the following hadith, 
it actually shows that the Mawla al-Qawmi minhum, that uh, the Mawla of a people is from them, and therefore he can attribute himself to them. So we'll read the next hadith. It's a long hadith. Babun Mawla al-Qawmi min anfusihim. That the Mawla, the free slave of a people, is one of them. So the full hadith. And the Fa'at ibn Rafi'in, رضي الله عنه, and the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم, Umar, رضي الله تعالى عنه, Ijma'li qawmak. Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم said to Umar, that gather your people, meaning gather Quraysh for me. فجمعهم, so he called them and he gathered them. فلما حضروا باب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, دخل عليه Umar, فقال قد جمعت لك قومي. So, when they, when they were by the door of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, Umar said they here. فسمع, سمع ذلك الأنصار, فقالوا قد نزل في قريش الوحي فجاء المستمع والناظر ما يقال لهم So some of the Ansar heard this and said that some revelation might have been brought about the Quraysh. So some of them came over to listen and watch what would take place. You know, the natural curiosity and the Sahaba would always you know, want to be eager to learn. So they thought maybe some new wahi, some special ruling has come for Quraysh. Um, so we also want to hear what that is. فخرج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقام بين أزهرهم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم came out uh, from his house and he stood amongst them. Okay, you can say in in the middle of them, in between them, among them. فقال هل فيكم من غيركم? He asked, is there anyone else here, meaning other than Quraysh? قالوا نعم. They said yes. فينا حليفنا Amongst us are our allies. So Halif, as I mentioned earlier, the three types of uh, connections that can be made between people. One was through freeing a slave and one was through Hilf, Munasara, where you agree to help each other. So these Halif were not actually from Quraysh, but they had this uh, agreement with Quraysh or certain individuals of Quraysh. Wabnu Ukhtina, there are some of our... Literally, our sister's sons. What this means is that you know so there are some ladies of Quraysh, but they had married out of Quraysh. So their sons technically are not considered Qurashi because Nasab is attributed to the father. Lineage is attributed to father. So we have some of our sister's children, meaning some of our, the children of our ladies, yeah, uh, who are, whose, whose fathers are not Qurashi. Umawalina and some of our free slaves as well. So they're not, not all of us here are Qurashi through Nasab. قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ حَلِيفُنَا مِنَّا وَبْنُ أُخْتِنَا مِنَّا وَمَوْلَانَا مِنَّا That all three of these are from us. This is the purpose here. That مَوْلَى الْقَوْمِ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ Just as if a person, if, if a slave is freed by someone in Quraysh, then he is also Qurashi. So he can call himself Qurashi. So that shows that the freed slave can attribute himself to the uh, tribe of his master. And by extension, it teaches us that just as we have good relations with our biological relations, we should have good relations with our Mawla, our Halif as well. Also our Ibn al-Ukh. Don't think that, oh, my sister married into a different family, so now her children are their problem. I shouldn't have anything to do with them. I'll look after you know, my side of the family, my, my my dad's side, my brother's side, my sister's not, you know, in some cultures they have this. When the girl gets married, that's it. She's her husband's problem. No, her children are also your nephews. They are from you as well. قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم حليفنا من أنتم تسمعون That, you know, you are listening, meaning you listen carefully. إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءِ مِنْكُمْ الْمُتَّقُونَ Uh, my friends among you are the God-fearing. Okay, in in another riwayat of Mu'adh, the similar wording that my friends are the muttaqin, whoever they are, wherever they are. So, you no know, closeness to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not necessarily through nasab. Somebody could be from Quraysh, could be from the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but if you don't have taqwa and they don't have fear of Allah and piety, then somebody else who is non-Arab, who has no blood relation, 
but they are in reality uh, closer to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and more beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So in kuntum ulaika fadaka. So if you are such, meaning if you are muttaqin fadaka, then so be it. That is good for you. Wa illa fanzuru. If not, then unzuru means watch out, be careful. Okay. La yati nas bil amali. Or fanzuru is translated here. Await the result of your actions. La yati nas bil amali yom al qiyamati wa taatun bil athqal. It should not be that other people come on the day of Qiyamah with good actions and you come with heavy burdens, meaning burdens of sins. Don't think just, just because I'm from Quraysh, just because I'm Banu Hashim, from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so I can do what I feel like and I'll be forgiven. No, no, you don't come uh, on the day of Qiyamah with sins. Why? For you aradu ankum, for then you will be shunned yeah meaning uh, you won't get my shafa'ah you won't get my intercession don't or don't hope for that don't just rely on that thumma nada then he called out saying faqal ya ayyuhan nas o people wa rafa'a yadayhi ba yada'uhuma ala ru'usi quraysh and he raised his hands and put them on the heads of the some of certain individuals of quraysh ayyuhan nas so he's talk, addressing gen, the general people now. The inna Quraysh and ahlu amanatin. The Quraysh are people of a trust. The trust over here is translated as trustworthy people, but according to other shurah like Mufti Ahmad Khan Puri and others, they say that no amana over here is referring to the Khilafah. that they are they are the ones who are burdened with the trust of the leadership. Because another hadith comes, al min Quraysh. That the leaders should be from Quraysh. So the trust of leadership is with Quraysh. Therefore, man baga bihim. Qal az bahirun azunnuhu qal al awathir. That whoever tries to lure them into pitfalls. Okay. So baga baghi to seek, to want. Sometimes it comes for baga alayhim to revolt as well. But over here, al awathir, awathir means um, a, a pit in the ground, which is like a trap to hunt, you know, wild animals, or it could be like un unlevel, uneven ground where a person trips. So uh, whoever tries to make them stumble, whoever tries to make them trip, meaning whoever doesn't want what's best for them, doesn't help them and support them, and goes against them uh, and their leadership, then كَبَّهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ لِمِنْ خَرَيْهِ Allah will let him fall over his own head. He will fall face first. Meaning he will be... Humiliated and disgraced. Don't try to go against Quraysh and revolt against them. Or Allah will disgrace you. يَقُولُ ذَلِكَ ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتِ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم repeated this uh, final statement three times. There are many lessons in this hadith, the virtue of Quraysh and so on. The main purpose is that وَمَوْلَانَا minna, That our Mawla, our freed slave, is from us. A side point here, some people say that it's not permissible to say Mawlana for a Sheikh. You should say, you should say Sheikh or Ustad. So, like I said, this is based on lack of knowledge of the Arabic language. They say that this is Shirk because Allah is the Mawla. It's true because one meaning of Mawla is Allah. But Mawla has so many other meanings. And when we call our teachers or our uh, scholars Mawlana, we don't mean that they are our gods. So that's, that's, that's a non-issue really. Babun man ala jariyataini aw wahida. Now Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi moves on to a new topic. Okay. First he started off with uh, parents, then he went on to relatives, and now he speaks specifically about children, and firstly from children he speaks about daughters. 
Because in pre-Islamic days, you know, women were treated very badly in Arabia, and girls were seen as a burden, you know, a fi- mainly a financial burden, because a boy would grow up and he would go out and work and he would earn. That would be good for the father. But if it was a girl, then the father would have to look after her and support her until she would get married. Um, and he wouldn't benefit, you know, he wouldn't really get any uh, financial benefit from a girl in most cases. This is why, you know, some of the Arabs would even bury their girls as soon as they were born or very soon after. So, and then, you know, when a man would die, his wife would be inherited by members of the family. So they treated women like their own uh, property. And if we look at the rest of the world as well, um, until very recently, uh, even in Europe and the Western world, women had been uh, treated as uh, inferior to men. And even now, even though we claim, Sheikh Adil Salahi says that we may claim to have e- equal status for men and women, yet when you see on a practical level, women continue to be exploited, often treated as sex objects, commercial advertising for a great variety of goods show women in a way that is bound to excite men's desire. The social setup requires women to go to work, neglecting their homes and children during the day and having to compress their household duties into a few hours in the evenings and at the weekends. In Muslim countries, strangely enough, women also suffer the blame for their suffering is laid at Islam's doorstep. It's, then he says, Islam is the religion of justice. It is also a religion for both men and women. It does not countenance the ill treatment of a single person, let alone half of society. Rasulullah always emphasized the importance of man's duty to be kind to his women folk. So, this, and he goes on, it's a long discussion on how Islam gives rights to women. So this, these ahadiths show that we must value our girls, value our daughters. And there are many virtues in looking after girls well um, and being kind to them. So, Babun man ala jariyataini aw wahida. That this chapter is regarding the reward of a person who takes care of two girls or even one. عن عقبة بن عامر رضي الله تعالى عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من كان له ثلاث بنات فصبر عليهن وكساهن من جدته كن له حجابا من النار He who has three daughters and is patient with them and clothes them according to his means they will be to him a shield from the fire so If you have three daughters and you look after them then that will be a protection and a shield for you from the uh, fire of Jahannam. And in the next hadith, Salut Amin Abbas al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ma min Muslimin tudrikuhum natan fi yuhsinu sahbatahuma illa adkhalatahu al Jannah. That any Muslim who has two daughters and takes good care of them, they will be his pass into heaven, into Jannah. There is a question here that the hadith has mentioned one. Imam Bukhari has mentioned one in his tarjama. So, possibly, Allahu alam, I, did, I didn't see this being dealt with in any of the commentaries that I have in front of me. Possibly, Imam Bukhari has a habit that he um, often indicates to narrations uh, which he wrote in his book through his chapters. So maybe Imam Bukhari had another narration which also mentioned one. And he's indicating to that. Or maybe through his istimbat and through his own deduction that if there is ajr for two and three, there will de- definitely be ajr and reward for one daughter as well. So if you only have one daughter and you look after her, then that will not be free from reward either. Wallahu alam. The third hadith of the chapter is that in the Jabir ibn Abdullah hadith of Qala Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam من كان له ثلاث بنات يؤويهن ويكفيهن ويرحمهن فقد وجبت له الجنة البتة فقال رجل من بعض القوم وثنتين يا رسول الله قال وثنتين رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم said 
whoever has three daughters whom he looks after and is compassionate to them uh, that he, you know, he gives them a shelter he gives them a home that he suffices them he's enough for them I mean he takes care of them and is compassionate and merciful and kind to them then certainly Jannah is uh, guaranteed for him Albatta definitely meaning he will definitely enter Jannah so a person said uh, what about two Ya Rasulullah Rasulullah and two as well Babun man ala thalatha akhawatin just like with daughters if a person looks after his sisters sometimes you know the father may be very elderly or uh, you know, not well off, maybe poor, a uh, weak, or for whatever reason, or maybe the father passes away very early and the girls are still young. So, if the brother looks after his sisters, then he will also be rewarded. Uh, anyone who has three daughters or three sisters and is kind to them will certainly be admitted into heaven. Subhanallah. Babu Fadliman Alam Zatahul Murduda. That if his daughter returns to him and he looks after her, then the virtue of that. Returns to him means for for example his daughter was married off and then she her husband passes away or she is divorced and therefore she comes back into the father's care. So he continues to look after her. He doesn't say, Oh you're you know you're you're not my problem anymore. Once I got you married, my duty was over. I don't need to look after you anymore. No, he, he takes her in and he looks after her. And there's virtue for that. Uh, and the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Suraqah bin Ju'shum. Suraqah bin Ju'shum is that Sahabi who in the uh, story of Hijrah you know, when the kuffar of uh, Mecca offered a uh, prize of a hundred camels for whoever could capture Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So he set out on his horse and he came close to, uh, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa However, as he got close, his horse, uh, the, the legs of his horses started to be taken in by the ground. You know, like, like what happens with, uh, what's it called now, when you have these sinkholes. So, you know, he, he, he called to Rasulullah that please make dua for me and I promise I won't harm you and I won't tell anyone of you. And Rasulullah Sallallahu made dua and then he was safe and then he later became Muslim. And, you know, in the uh, battle of... Ah, sorry, no. There's another story about him that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh Suraka, how will you be when the... Uh, bangles or the bracelets of the king of Persia the Persian emperor will be in, uh, on your hands you'll be wearing them now imagine these early days when the Muslims are in such a weak and destitute situation and the Persian empire is at its height, you know, at its might it was inconceivable that in his lifetime he would be wearing the bangles of the Persian emperor but in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, this actually happened. That when the Persian Empire was conquered, those bangles were brought to Medina. And as Umar then called uh, Suraka and he said, and he placed them on his hands, said, everyone witness the sea of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi And then he took them off, took them back off him. So, um, this is Suraka. So you hear Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, that shall I not tell you of the greatest form of charity, or min a'zamis sadaqa, one of the greatest forms of charity. This aw, we read it as aw qala. This is a shak min al rawi. Sometimes you have aw, hadith, there to show that the, the narrator doesn't remember the exact wording. So was there a min or not? So this shows how meticulous and particular the muhaddithin were. That if they weren't sure of even one word, they would clarify, I'm not sure. So one of the narrators said that I don't remember 
if my teacher said a'zami sadaqa or min a'zami sadaqa qala bala so i should when i read it i should read it as ala adulluka ala a'zami sadaqa aw qala min a'zami sadaqa qala he said ya bala ya rasul of course ya rasul please do qala ibnatuka mardudatan ilayk that if your mardudatun ilayk if your daughter is returned to you as I explained, she's divorced, her husband passes away. لَيْسَ لَهَا كَاسِبٌ And she has no one to uh, earn for her, to support her, other than you. So in that case, if you look after her, this is from the greatest forms of charity and forms of ajr. Hadith number 81 is the same hadith with a different chain of narration. Hadith number 82, عَنِ الْمِقْدَابِ بْنِ مَعْدِي كَلِبَ رضي الله تعالى عنه أنه سمع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول ما أطعمت نفسك فهو لك صدقة وما أطعمت ولدك فهو لك صدقة وما أطعمت زوجك فهو لك صدقة وما أطعمت خادمك فهو لك صدقة سبحان الله We, we mentioned in the last lesson as well that we tend to think charity is only sending to other places around the world where people are starving رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم says that whatever you feed yourself is صدقة for you Whatever you feed your children is sadaqah for you. You get ajal and thawab of sadaqah. Whatever you feed your wife is sadaqah for you. And whatever you feed your servant is also sadaqah for you. This is the kindness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mercy of Allah. That we fulfill our obligations, which we had to do anyway. But still Allah rewards us. Okay? Normally you think if somebody does something extra, which is nafal, then they should be rewarded. Well, Allah Ta'ala rewards us even for our obligations as if, as if they are a uh, optional. So we fulfill our obligation and we also get rewarded as long as our intention is we do it for the sake of Allah and we do it to obey the command of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Babun man kariha an yatamanna mawt al-banat That is extremely disliked and it's a very abhorrent act that a person should wish that his daughters would die. So, and Ibn Umar al Ibn Umar al said, "If you don't want them to die, then Ibn Umar said, 'You should feed them.'" Ibn Umar said, "There was a man who had some daughters, and he said that he wished his daughters would die." Okay, he's probably he might not have even meant it, Allah Wallam. But you know, I mean, he was probably just so destitute. Uh, you know, with poverty and so needy, you know, and sometimes when you're financially in a bad position, you say all sorts. So he said some words like, I wish my daughters would just die, then I wouldn't have the burden of looking after them. But ibn Umar, Umar al- ibn Umar was very angry and said to him, Anta Are you the one who provides for them? Do you give them provisions? Do you give risk or does Allah give risk? If Allah is the one who gives risk, then how can you wish for that? Death. This is very, very something very abhorrent, very evil, to wish they would die uh, for any reason, but especially because you can't afford to look after them. That means that you think that risk is in your hands. Risk is in the hands of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Babun al waladu majbanatun. So some other lessons with regards to having uh, children. That Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that children are cause for bukhl, miserliness, stinginess, and also cowardice. Now Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi has, hasn't mentioned this hadith, so he just brings it in. This is actually a hadith that Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi has. Uh, brought the hadith as his uh, uh, chapter heading. Um, and this is his practice, that if a hadith is not, uh, for some reason, he doesn't want to bring it with its sanad as part of the book, he just brings it into the chapter. So, Al-Waladu Mabkhalatun Majbanatun is a hadith um, that children cause a person to become miserly and also to become cowardly. This is because when you don't have children, you just spend freely. You know, you eat out and you buy cars and you do this and you do that. And when you have children, then you start thinking, oh, I have to save for their college fund and I'm, I have to get them married and I have to do this and I have to do that. So naturally, this causes bukhul. 
but it shouldn't make you so bakhil and so miserly and stingy that you you know stop spending in the path of Allah or you stop fulfilling your uh, duties upon you okay. and same with majbana uh, that you know a person is very brave and you know he's not scared to lose his life if he has to go in the path of Allah you know he's brave uh, but w- once he has children then he starts thinking oh what will happen to my children uh, if i uh, if i die so of course this is natural this is supposed this is bound to happen however it shouldn't happen to the extent where you forget the rights of allah and the hukam of allah just for the sake of your children so we should be mindful of this and aisha radiyallahu anha qalat qala abu bakr radiyallahu anhu yawman wallahi ma ala al-ardi rajul ahabbu ilayya min umar فلما خرج رجع فقال كيف حلفت أي بنية فقلت له قال أعز علي والولد الوط عائشة رضي الله عنها reports that one day Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه said by Allah no man on the face of the earth do I love better than Umar سبحان الله look at the love between the two this was of course after the demise of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم so on the face of the earth um, there is no one more beloved to me than Umar. When he returned, so he so he he went out and he came. He returned. So he went out. He must have thought for a bit and he came back. He said, what oath did I take, O oh my daughter, beloved daughter? So, فَقُلْتُ Aisha says, I said. This is what you said. I repeated the words. So, قَالَ Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه said. أعز علي من عمر أعز علي عمر is the most dearest والولد الوط but the one's child or one's children are closer meaning that natural love which you have and the natural bond that you have is for your children but in terms of respect and in terms of that عقلي love that you love a person for their virtue and you love a person for their knowledge, for their piety, for the status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, Mawlana Shafi Tanwi explains this in one place, that some love is tab'i, it's natural. And some tab- some love is aqli, that you love someone for a reason. So, that aql through reasoning, I have for Umar, because Umar radiallahu anhu, after Abu Bakr, he is the most virtuous, uh, of the, and at that time, of all the people alive, um, he was the most, after Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the most highest in rank and the most beloved in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for that for that reason, he loved Umar the most. But of course, with you know your natural uh, affection and your natural love for your children is more than anything else. So he used the word Az. Izza can mean respect, but it also means love. So it is translated as dearest here. And alwat, uh, lawat is like it's a coating that you put on a house, on a pond, or something which you dig to make sure that water doesn't seep out of it. So it's very close. It's it's literally it's uh, stuck to the pond. So it's, you know their love is they they are stuck in our heart like glue. So you know we can't separate ourselves from them. Of course we love our children um, more. This also shows. The ihtiyat and cautiousness of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that he real he you know he spoke but then he he, he checked his words. This is what you call muraqaba that when you when you do something you say something reflect that what have I done what have I said am I being honest am I lying I'm not I'm not exaggerating am I so when he thought about it he realized that I might not be totally true in what I'm saying so he came back and he clarified that this is what I meant by ahab. حديث نمبر 85 عن ابن أبي نعيم قال كنت شاهدا ابن عمر إذ سأله رجل عن دم البعوضة فقال ممن أنت فقال من أهل العراق قال انظروا إلى هذا يسألني عن دم البعوضة وقد قتلوا من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم سمعت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول هما ريحاني إن سمر روايات هما ريحانايا من الدنيا ابن أمو نعم سيد I was with Ibn Umar when a man asked him about the blood 
of a gnat. A gnat is an insect like a mosquito. So he said, what's the hukam of that? Maybe this was in Ihram. So he's asking that um, if if I kill a gnat or an insect, a small insect like a mosquito, uh, it, it, you know, what happens? Do I have to pay a penalty in Ihram? Because in Ihram, you're not supposed to kill any animals that are supposed to hunt. Or maybe the question is in relation to the blood. Sometimes when you kill, you know, small insects, they have a little bit of blood on them. So does that is that najis? And should I wash it before I pray? So whatever his question was, but he's asking about the blood of this small insect. Ibn Umar said, you know, which who are you from? Meaning which which people uh, which which place are you from? Which tribe are you from? فقال من أهل العراق said from the people of Iraq. قال سيدنا عمر said انظروا إلى هذا. Look at this person. يسألني عن دم البعوضة وقد قتلوا من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. So he's asking me about the blood of a mosquito when he's from Iraq and the Iraqis are the one who killed the grandson of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. You know, it's likely that Ibn Umar would have recognized just by looking at him that he's from Iraq, from his clothing and his, uh, you know, just by his features. So, but he asked him to confirm. And the grief and the wound of the despicable murder of Hussein bin Ali radiallahu anhu in the uh, plain of Karbala, it's a long story how he was invited by the people of Iraq because Kufa was his grandfather Sayyidina Ali's Darul Khilafa. And when Yazid uh, took the Khilafat and Imarat for himself, you know, the Sahaba were not happy with that. So the people of Iraq said that we haven't done bay'ah to Yazid. The Ahl Hijaz have not done bay'ah to Yazid yet. So he's not an established Khalifa. So you come to Kufa and we'll support you and we'll take you as our Khalifa and we'll depose Yazid. However, Yazid had a lot of might and strength and he had some brutal leaders like Ubaidullah bin Ziyad and others. So he sent them to Iraq and in a very short time, by the time Sayyidina Hussein left from Medina and before he could reach Iraq, the whole tide in Iraq turned and they killed his cousin Muslim bin Aqil and you know they obviously struck fear in the hearts of the people of Iraq and basically the people of Iraq turned they turned and they went against Sayyidina Hussein and they were the cause for his murder so this was still fresh in Ibn Umar's mind so imagine you see somebody who killed the grandson not, not, not personally from that same people from the same area from the same country so he, he got angry that you're from Iraq, you are the people that killed the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He got emotional. And you're asking me about the blood of a mosquito? Samitu Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, huma rayhaniya min al-dunya. I saw, so rayhaniya or rayhani, rayhaniya, different ways it's been read. That I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, they are my sweet flowers in this world. The word rayhan, has a meaning of rih in the fragrance. So any fragrant flower can be called reihan. So they are my fragrant flowers. Meaning just like a person, when he smells the flower and, you know, it gives him so much comfort and enjoyment. So these, you know, my Hassan and Hussein, they are like flowers for me. That when I embrace them, I feel so much joy. Um, this is an expression of his love and affection for them. So we learn from there that just as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refers to his grandsons as his flowers, we should also treat our children like our little flowers. They're delicate. You have to look after your flowers well. You know, you have to uh, keep them in uh, well-nourished, water them properly. Otherwise, you know, and you smell them, you get comfort from them. So we should have affection for our children and we should look after them well. This is also a sunnah to carry your children on the shoulders. And Rasulullah did this. This shows how affectionate and how kind he was 
despite being you know, the master of both worlds and the Nabi Akhir Zaman, the final prophet of Allah, but still, you know, he would carry his own grandsons on his uh, shoulders. So, Samit al Bara Yakul at Miss Allah, right to Nabiya Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or Hassan Wala Atiki, who we call Allah, who in Wahibu Hufa Ahiba. Bara Radi Allah and Sayyid, I saw Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam carrying Hassan on his shoulder, Radi Allah one. And he said, My, uh, my Rabb, O oh Allah, I love him and I pray that you love him. You also love him. So he made dua for him that since I love him, oh Allah, you should also love him. If Allah loves him, if Rasulullah is praying for that, of course Allah loves Hassan Hussein. And another hadith it comes that Allah loves anyone who loves them. So we also love Hassan Hussein with the hope that through that we will gain Allah's love. Babun al walad al uh, the child is the coolness of a person's eyes. When you have children and they are well behaved and they are obedient and they are kind, then they bring happiness. For, and, and the coolness of eyes is an expression of happiness. They say when you cry out of grief, your eyes well up and go red and they feel hot. But when a person cries tears of joy, then the eyes feel cool. Allahu alam. So this is why Qulat al-Ain means happiness. And Jubair ibn Fayr and Abihi qala jalasna idh miqtayn al-asfali yawman fumara bihi rajlun wa qala tuba li hatayn al-aynayn al-latayn ra'ata Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wallahi la wajidna anna ra'ayna ma ra'ayta wa shahidna ma shahidta fastughzib. Jubair ibn Fayr says one day we were with the Sahabi al-Miqdad bin al-Aswad. He's also a famous Sahabi. He, he, he was present in Battle of Badr. In Badr, he was the only Sahabi to have his to, to be on a horse. So, uh, he Mishdad bin Aswad says, uh, we were with him, and a man who was passing by said to him, Blessed be these two eyes which saw Allah's Messenger. By Allah, we wish that we had seen what you have seen, and witnessed what you have witnessed. His words made al Mihdad very angry. He was trying to say that I wish I could have been a Sahabi. I wish I could have been uh, alive at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But this, this in itself was not a wrong thing. But the reason Miqdad became angry is explained in the next part. فَجَعَلْتُ أَعْجَبُ So uh, the narrator, uh, Jubail, says that even I was astonished and surprised. مَا قَالَ إِلَّا خَيْرًا so that person didn't say anything bad. All he said is, I wish I was a Sahabi. I wish I could see Rasulullah. So said, What's wrong with that? Then Miqdad turned to him. Why should you wish to have been present on an occasion which Allah has kept him away from? لو شهده كيف يكون فيه and he doesn't he doesn't know that if he was present how would he be meaning that it's very easy to say oh I wish I was alive at the time of Rasulullah you know I would have believed in him I would have supported him and I would have done this and I would have done that but how do you know that you know it wasn't easy being a Sahabi the Sahaba had to go through the most difficult tests and uh, how do you know that if you were alive at that time, you might not have even accepted Islam because it was so difficult. You may have died as a kafir, as a mushrik. So just be happy with the condition you are in. There's a lesson here. If Allah Ta'ala has not tested us in a certain way, we shouldn't wish for that. But some people, if we're well off, we say, oh, if I was poor, you know, I, I would still give lots of charity and I would work hard and I would do this, I would do that. You don't know that. You can't guarantee that. Okay? Or we are very lucky that, um, you know, we're living in relative comfort. There's people around the world, especially in Palestine right now, who are suffering so much. So we shouldn't say or think, oh, if I was in Palestine, I would do this. If I was there, I would do that. It's easy to say, but if we were really there, would, would we really be able to do those things? Would we have the same patience and sabr and strength and resolve that they are showing uh, to the Ummah right now? So... We shouldn't, you know, if Allah has made something easy for you, don't wish or don't fantasize that if I was challenged in this way and that way, I would have done this. 
So then he elaborates. Wallahi laqad hadara Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqwamun kabbahumullahu ala manakhilihim fi jahannam. By Allah, certain people saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah has thrown them on their faces in jahannam. Lam yujibuhu wa lam yusaddiquhu because they did not respond to him, they did not accept his call, and they did not affirm him, they didn't believe in him. أَوَلَا تَحْمَدُونَ اللَّهَ إِذْ أَخْرَجَكُمْ لَا تَعْرِفُونَ إِلَّا رَبَّكُمْ do you not, Why do you not praise Allah that he took you out in such a condition that you only know Allah? Okay? Some, some people are born Muslims, so and they might say things like, oh, if I was born a non-Muslim, I would still have used my logic and researched and become a Muslim. How do you know that? Just thank Allah that He gave you you know He He gave you Islam and He let you be born in a Muslim family. There's no guarantee that if you weren't born a Muslim, there's no guarantee you would have accepted Islam. So thank Allah, be thankful. Don't think that oh even if I wasn't born Muslim I would have accepted it anyway. So that you can believe in what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa brought. قَدْ كُفِيتُمُ الْبَلَاءَ بِغَيْرِكُمْ That others have sufficed you in afflictions. Meaning the Sahaba have taken all the hardship and the difficulty and you've been spared it. وَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ بُعِثَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَىٰ أَشَدِّ حَالٍ بُعِثَ عَلَيْهَا نَبِيٌّ قَطُّ فِي فَتْرَةٍ وَجَاهِلِيَّةٍ By Allah, Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم was sent in the most difficult situation which any prophet had to contend at a time of no revelation and when ignorance was widespread. Patra, if the last prophet before Rasulullah is Isa alayhi salam, and there's approximately 600 years between them. So before Rasulullah, many prophets came, but there were prophets before them. The people were accustomed, especially in Bani Israel, one after the other prophets were coming. So people understood what a prophet is. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came, you know, in a time where no prophet had come to the world for 600 years. And for the Arabs especially, since Ibrahim alayhi salam, that would be, you know, maybe a few thousand years, maybe two thousand years, Allahu alam, that no prophet had come uh, since Ibrahim among, or Ismail amongst the Arabs. So therefore, it's not, it, it, that made it more challenging. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the most difficult challenge from any prophet. Like it comes in another place, that Fir'auni Akbaru min Fir'auni Musa. The my Fir'aun, meaning Abu Jahl, is greater and not greater, uh, uh, greater in evil, more wretched than the Fir'aun of Musa. They say that at least when the, the Fir'aun of Musa was uh, about to die, he tried to accept, uh, believe in Allah. Amantu billazi amrabi Musa. Whereas the Fir'aun of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Jahl, even when uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was about to chop his head off, he, he says to Ibn Mas'ud that when you chop my head, chop it from low, chop, you know, take some of the chest with it. So when you when it's displayed with the other, uh, pe- uh, other people who have been killed, I want my head to be higher than everyone else's. So even when death was certain, his takabur and his arrogance didn't leave him. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa suffered the greatest challenges and his nubuwat uh, and, and, and the challenges of nubuwat more, were more difficult than anyone else. With jahiliyyah, he came in a time of such ignorance. مَا يَرَوْنَ أَنَّ دِينًا أَفْضَلُ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْأَوْثَانِ That the, the, the people he was sent to, they did not see any religion to be better than idolatry, idol worship. فَجَاءَ بِفُرْقَانٍ so he came with the Furqan. Furqan, the criterion which differentiates between good, uh, between right and wrong. And by this message of his, this was a cause for a split and disputes between a father and his own children. In many cases, the children are Muslim, the father is not. Sometimes it's the other way around. And they face each other in battle. You know, has Abu Bakr and one of his sons said to him that, you know, my father, once in a battle I had a chance, I could have killed you, but I spared you. 
انا ابو بكر الاسد يقول لك هي وزن ذا بيرا اون اون هاف سبيد يو حتى ان كان رجل يرى والده او ولده او اخاه كافرا وقد فتح الله قفل قلبه بالايمان that many a times a person would see his father his child his brother as a disbeliever whilst Allah had opened the locks of his heart with iman ويعلم انه ان هلك دخل النار and he would know that if his father or his brother or his son was to die without islam he will enter the hell fire you know you know people who are new muslims we feel sorry for them you know it, it, it's so difficult for them to accept that you know their family members so many of them will die without islam and it's one of the most difficult things for them to bear for the sahaba this was a norm for them this was every day for them because most of them were converts so their family members were not so his eyes could never be cool meaning he could never be happy whilst knowing that his beloved will be in Jahannam and this is regarding which Allah Ta'ala revealed that they pray the believers pray O oh, our Lord Grant us from our spouses and offsprings who will be a joy to our eyes and cause us to be foremost among the God-fearing. In this ayat, Allah Ta'ala teaches us to pray for our families, our wives, our children to be our qurratul a'yun, the coolness of our eyes. And the Sahabi is indicating that your children will only be coolness of your eyes if they, number one, have iman, and if they are pious, and if they are dutiful and obedient, then your children will be the coolness of your eyes. This is why in the uh, upcoming chapters, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, will re- indicate towards the importance of tarbiyah and uh, looking, uh, disciplining and teaching good manners and good knowledge to our children, which inshallah we will talk about. In the next lesson, وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله ربنا العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعليه وأصحابه أجمعين. Any questions today? Does it only apply to someone who has daughters only, or is it only mixed up boys and girls? No, if if they have boys and girls, but they they have girls as well. That will apply to them. It doesn't have to be only girls. Okay. The hadith isn't restricted. It just says that if somebody has girls, he looks after them, he will get this ajar. I just want to add that just the fact that women are compared to men and that the man is the standard. Yeah. You know, even the way the dress and every jeans show has to show that women are seen as less good than men in Western countries, or at least in Scandinavia. This is true. So, you know, even though we claim that in Western world, we have equal rights. In reality, we don't. And Islam is the most perfect religion. It's from Allah, our Creator. So, Allah Ta'ala knows us. Allah knows men and women and how we are, how we are created. And Allah has given us rulings and ahkam accordingly. So, it's, our good can only be in obedience to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. If we move away from Allah's guidance, that can never be good for us. That's something that you know, it's clear and it's a given for anyone who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, Jazakumullah khairan for attending. I always appreciate your attendance. May Allah ta'ala reward you. May Allah give us the ability to benefit from what we have said and forgive any shortcomings. Jazakumullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.